Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Red Men TV and your latest edition of Expert Insight. And we've got a little bit of a change of pace from the whole transfer speculation and conversations about footballers. And I'm delighted to say I'm joined by football finance expert and one of the voices of the very popular The Price of Football podcast, Kieran Maguire. Kieran, how are you doing? I'm doing grand. There's uh, there's no off season in football finance, as as you and I have probably both discovered mm. uh, over the course of the last couple of months. So yeah, full on. Uh, looking forward to next season. Look, looking forward to getting back to the University of Liverpool as well to teach. Yeah, absolutely. It was a glorious day in Liverpool today. You'll be glad to know. We haven't had the best of weather recently, but it's been doing okay. Been ticking on by. Um, but yeah, as you say, no no off-season whatsoever. No off-switch, it appears, on football at the minute. Um, whether it's not transfer-related, it's actually football-related. If it's not football-related, it's finance-related. And I've had a couple of conversations on the topic we're going to speak about in just a moment. Not for a little while, because it has been quiet on this front. Um, I spoke to Dave Powell, the Liverpool Echo, a few times on it, and he's obviously very well-versed on what's going on. So I'll take it right back to the start with you, Kieran, if we can. Um, it was back in November the initial report started emerging, the FSG. It was initially sort of build as looking for a sale, a full sale of the football club. It's since been downgraded from that and they are just looking for minority investment. And I guess the first place to start is when you first heard FSG were looking for investment, what was your reaction to that? Were you surprised by that? Did it feel like a good time to be doing it? I I don't think I was hugely surprised. What did surprise me last year was somebody willing to pay £2.5 billion for Chelsea, given that the club had had its assets frozen, Mm -hmm. given that the club had lost £900,000 a week for 19 years under Roman Abramovich and has got a stadium which is, you know, realistically 20 to 30,000 below um, its peer group and and therefore it's it's struggling to compete uh, in terms of of ticket sales and getting into Europe and so on. Um, and, And that set a new benchmark. So when that did happen, I guess part of my reaction would be, well, some of the existing owners will be wanting to test the market to see what potentially they could sell their club for. And yeah, I'm, I'm not... I'm not really into sort of the the willy waving contests that fans have in terms of my club's a bigger club than your club and so on. But there is no doubt that both Liverpool and Manchester United, as and I don't I know you probably don't like this word, as brands are far bigger than Chelsea, given they've had far longer historic success. And, and that's helped to build up a global fan base that that's you know, if, if, in terms of who's going to get the most interest uh, when stories come out. Yeah, Manchester United and Liverpool are the two biggest in the country and, and arguably certainly certainly in the top 10 in the world. Um, so I, I guess it, it was, let's see what happens next. And therefore, when FSG made the initial announcement, it was a logical thing for them to do to see just how much interest there was and to to then to see whether they wanted to, to take that that further in a variety of means uh, in terms of full sale, partial sale or or nothing at all. Yeah, absolutely. And since then, I mean, we're eight months on now from that sort of initial report suggesting they were open to investors. And there have been some tentative reports, some tentative interest from groups, it appears. I mentioned earlier, I spoke to Dave Powell a couple of times and he's got wind of a couple of inquiries and conversations that have gone on around it. But it doesn't feel like FSG have made massive progress in any minority sale of Liverpool as it stands. And do you think, do you think that's in part due to the Manchester United situation, because of course, as you mentioned, we're talking about two of the biggest institutions in sport, let alone football. And you think both entities, both brands, both clubs going on the market at the same time, it must be pretty unheard of in a finance landscape to have them to both be open for sale or investment at the same time. And also, do you think one has impacted the other in as much as the United ones kind of taken centre stage, which has meant Liverpool haven't quite attracted the interest that they might have done? Yeah, to a certain extent, you you wouldn't detect uh, Apple and Microsoft to both put themselves up for sale at the same time. And and when it comes to to Liverpool and Manchester United, I think realistically they are the equivalent in terms of uh, sporting institutions, certainly this country is concerned, and also in terms of the the attraction they have all over the world. Um, 
to a certain extent, I, I thought that the the two potential clubs, you know, two potential sales could elevate. They could effectively be stepping stones. You know, one party comes in for one of the clubs, gets rebuffed, then moves across to the other, and and, and that would be be used. Um, FSG, in my view, are far more laser focused on the on the business side, and I think they they quickly realised that perhaps what they were hoping that they could get for a full sale wouldn't necessarily be generated. And they are still very much of the view that football is is undervalued in, in terms of what it can achieve in, in engaging with fans. And, and in engaging with fans is another word for emptying their wallets. Um, yeah, if, if you take a look at Liverpool, total revenues in 2022 of £594 million, pounds, well, yeah, you know, they've they've got a, a global fan base which which does run into the tens, if not the hundreds of millions, and and, and therefore that works out as on a per fan basis as as very little. Um, so FSG have, have certainly of the view that um, changes in technology, changes in the structure of football, and we know that they've they've been involved on both a domestic and uh, a European level to to concentrate. Um, power and money in the hands of fewer and fewer clubs, of which they would have been one, mm-hmm. um, would have been very uh, financially beneficial to them. So, uh, the I think the lack of progress is is due to the fact that if I was on the buying side, I'm not quite sure what I'd be getting. You know, ten percent of Liverpool um, in. In the Premier League is great in many ways, but from a business point of view, it, it's not great in the sense that you want certainty. And uh, one of the issues with you know, the reason why uh, John Henry and co were so keen on Super League and Project Big Picture is that it effectively gave them control of the game. And they would have, um, and with the Super League, you don't have to win football matches to qualify for the competition, as we've seen for next season. You know, with Liverpool not being in the Champions League, that uncertainty is not attractive to potential investors. And if I was buying you know, 10 to 15% of the club, and, and, and I speak to Dave Powell as, as you do on a regular basis, and, and Dave's a great guy and he's you know, clearly got insights and contacts that uh, that are, are, are very, very useful. Um, what are what are you getting? You know, because if ten percent of the club for the three four hundred million pounds for a, for a company which on an operational level breaks even from year to year, and and then you know it makes a, ideally makes some profits in the transfer market which gets reinvested. Um, the financial return is not huge, um, although I think the potential for where Liverpool could be in 10 years in what's a very much changing world, um, th- then that becomes a bit of a speculative punt. And you know, for hundreds of millions of pounds, that's that, that's a lot of money for what is effectively a, lot, a, a, a lottery ticket. Yeah, it certainly is, yeah. And I often wonder with the sort of, the sales of football clubs like Liverpool and indeed, you know, investment in it, it often feels to me like not so much a lost leader because that's not quite the case, but you're not doing it to make millions and millions of pounds of profit. You're doing it to have something on your portfolio. That's how it often feels. And maybe, you know, Liverpool are still looking for the right people to want to do that. And before we move on to the current situation, I wanted to ask you, um, FSG have recently reappointed their president, Mike Gordon, into back into sort of duties around the football club because for a while he stepped away from that and he was looking for investors. He was, he was on the hunt, essentially, for the pursuit of the money that they're looking for. Does that show to you or does that suggest to you that they've either given up the chase for investment for the meantime or perhaps they've found some interested parties and there's different things going on now on that? I, I think they've... They've certainly scaled down in terms of the the full sale scenario, and and that quite I think that that decision was made relatively early in terms of discussions that they had with with potential interested parties. So I think his move back onto operational things is that Liverpool now want to focus on on being a business again, and they're not having to spend so much time pitching to potential external parties uh, trying to drum drum up money. Um, I suspect that they, if they've not found anybody in eight months, then they're not going to find anybody at all in terms of you know this this minority stake. Um, so 
it, we, what we could have is is people you know, making operations in the background. Um, and in terms, I, I, I agree with you in terms of the you know, sort of having a, a portfolio of of investments that can generate money. Um, football's an unusual business in the sense that. With the exception of Manchester United, where where yeah the Glazers for, certainly for the last six years have used it as an ATM and taken out dividends on a regular basis, the only time you're going to make money from a football club is at the sale date. Um, in all probability, now whether you sell a, a part element or a full element w- waits to see. Um, yeah, Mike, Mike Ashley published his accounts for his personal company yesterday and, and it showed that he made a profit um on the sale of newcastle of 195 million um in between he he put money into the club and, and mike ashley contentious figure controversial figure but he, he did lend the, the club money on an interest-free basis fsg have lent money uh you know through through their vehicles to to uksv which is effectively liverpool's holding company on an interest-free basis as well so so there is a cost of running the club and you aim to recoup that sort of those lost opportunities and that money which has been lent which you could have been used on other projects at the sale date um i, I think what fsg are saying okay we bought it for 300 million uh when it was when liverpool was a distressed asset um under the the lunacy of Hicks and Gillette. Um, we can get our money back now and still own 80% of the club and still benefit um, as, as the majority shareholder going forward. And th- there's no doubt that American owners and investors are very, very bullish with regards to the prospects of football. They, they think that we are pretty rubbish um, at, at selling the product. And we're starting to see some of that coming through from American owners. And I, and I know that this isn't a club which is really on Liverpool's radar, but for example, Bournemouth have, have been acquired by an American Texas in, investor. First thing that happens is that um, ticket prices go up by up to 20%. You've got merchandise costs going up by 20%. They're still behind you know, the, the likes of Manchester United, Liverpool, because they, you know, Bournemouth as a brand doesn't have it. Um, we've seen at Manchester United, uh, now they've got a strategy of uh, if, if fans can't get to matches, they will buy the tickets back from the fans at so you know, one nineteenth of your season ticket price. And then they will, they will effectively sell that ticket to tourist fans for three to four hundred pounds, um, offering a match day experience, which appears to uh get you a pucker pie for nothing and uh uh you know you, you sit in a warehouse in 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 trafford with uh you know listening to a few gags from mickey thomas um and, and that's that's where the club owners want to go um you know th- they actually dislike uh the likes of you and i who have got season tickets in our club and watch them home and away and uh, and don't spend an hour in the mega store before or after the match because we're we're a legacy problem of the game of football. Um, and uh, certainly as far as FSG strategy is concerned, you, you look at the capacity of Anfield, you look at the proportion of tickets which go to season ticket holders, it's very, very low because they want to monetize the remainder of the fan base. Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that little section of my chat with the brilliant Kim Maguire. I'm sure you'll agree he knows everything there is to know in the world of football finance. If you want to hear more of that conversation where we discuss exactly what could happen next with FSG search for investment, then make sure you head to redmenplus.com. And if you do, you can use code Bobby to get Club Captain yearly subscription for half price. I will see you over there. Hey, so pre-season is just around the corner for the mighty Reds, but if you want to spend your days, weeks and hours celebrating a Liverpool legend, then check out Bobby Firmino, Best in the World, our three-part documentary series, episodes two and three, exclusively streaming on redmenplus.com right now with full interviews from so many of our amazing contributors, including the Liverpool skipper, Jordan Henderson, the greatest goal scorer the club's ever seen, Ian Rush, and a hell of a lot more right now go to redmenplus.com all episodes of Bobby Firmino best in the world streaming today 